Welcome to AP Chemistry at Ahamaniga High School. I'm Brian Brown, and today we'll be picking up Chapter 14. Now, this begins our second semester in AP Chemistry, and this really begins a sequence of chapters that are really important in chemistry terms as well as AP Chemistry test terms. Uh, and sometimes these ideas are referred to as a big five because they're heavily represented on the test. Now, chemical kinetics is typically about three out of the 75 multiple choice questions and FRQ, pretty much every single year there is a question related to kinetics. So this is a, a core chapter in chemistry. It's, it's also a heavy math chapter. So if you like math, this is one that you're going to enjoy. It's really one of my favorite chapters overall because it has so many mathematical connections in it. And it's not really heavy, difficult math. It's really heavily math concept oriented. Uh, so we apply mathematics in a number of different ways in this chapter. But it's really a core idea overall to chemistry. Now, kinetics is the study of the rate at which different processes occur. Now, besides information about the speed with which reactions occur, kinetics also sheds light on the, what's called the reaction mechanism. The reaction mechanism is how the reaction actually occurs. So it's the mechanism by which the reaction actually, on a particle-by-particle -particle basis, actually progresses. And one thing that's really very important in this chapter is that you read and understand the chapter. This is one of those that it just really helps to get background so you get to the point where it's straight in your head. Also, you'll notice that uh, many a days in this chapter, one of the things we'll do after we go through the homework is we'll take a look at some practice problems related to concepts from the previous night's notes. So before you actually get into the homework and try it, we'll go through and try some of these concepts together. And the practice sheets will have more questions than we'll actually go through and solve. But I strongly, strongly recommend that what you do is you complete the sheets and posted online are the practice help movies that basically go through the other questions. So if there's four questions in a particular topic, we'll break down and do one together and take a look at it. But the other three questions, by the time that test rolls around, you should have attempted those questions and gone through and watched the, the in-depth help movie related to those questions so you get enough depth to understand because it's the type of chapter that once you get it straight in your head, honestly, it's not that bad of an idea, but you have to dig deep enough to really make the connections that you need to understand the questions. So this is a, a chapter that you need to understand the complexity and break it down in ways that make sense to you. And that's going to take a little extra work with some of the ideas in this chapter, which is why I give you, you know, multiple problems to attempt. And I go through and do an in-depth movie breakdown, basically, of the solutions to those things. So you get to the point where you can really see the connections that you need to make. Now, first section gets into factors that affect reaction rates. Now, there's two things that deal with the nature of the reactions that involve reaction rates. And one would be how state affects reaction rates, and the other would be how the identity can have an effect on reaction rates. Now, first off, in order to react, and this is something in pre-AP chemistry um, you're exposed to, molecules must come in contact with each other. Unless they're at the same place at the same time, molecules and particles can't interact with each other. So they need to come in contact. They need to collide, which is why the theory fundamentally behind the concept of reaction rates is referred to as collision theory. Now, the concept behind the need to come together in the same time and place and collide can be affected by what state you're in. If you take a look at what's going on with liquids and gases and solids and even aqueous things, well, first off, liquids. Liquids are more dense than a gas situation. So that's going to mean more collisions are occurring. So that's going to have an effect on the reaction. So if you have gases interacting with each other, in your reaction, uh, that's going to typically be a slower process than when we have liquids involved because the particles are simply close together in the liquid state. Gases are spread out too much, and while they will collide with each other, just not to the same degree that liquids do, so you're typically going to see slower rates in reactions that involve gases. Now solids, no mobility. You basically have particles that are locked in place. So what you typically get is just surface collisions. So if it's a liquid or a gas, yes, on the surface of the substance, you will get collisions, but it's severely limited because of how that solid is held together. So typically solids aren't gonna do much in many reaction situations. And that's because of the restricted mobility and restricted access to collisions. Now, the last one would be the aqueous state. We, you know, 
aqueous is not really a state of matter, so to speak, but is an important state of being chemically. When you're dissolved in water, whether you're a gas or a solid, um, you're going to be reacting much more quickly because you're much more accessible to the other things that are in that situation. So many reactions we look at are in the aqueous state, and these things tend to be rapid reactions. Case in point, precipitation reactions with metathesis double replacement. You guys did a lab in pre-AP chemistry where you put two solutions together. The cations formed an insoluble precipitate. They weren't soluble. And it was almost instantaneous that you would see the solid precipitate out of the solution. Now, another thing that can affect reaction rates that is related to the nature of the substances would be dealing with the identities of the substances involved in the situation. The more homogeneous a mixture is, the faster the molecules can react because the particles are more evenly mixed together. If they're not homogeneous, substance A may not be near substance B to cause the reaction to occur. And then other things related to chemical identity, couple important ones. One, usually oppositely charged particles react fast. Case in point, the aqueous reaction for precipitation we talked about a second ago. And that's because those Coulombic attractions help speed up the reactions. If they get close to each other, they're much more likely to come in contact because of the Coulombic opposite attraction. And then another fundamental thing that's important, it's kind of common sense, but it's something you need to rationalize and, and conceptualize when you're thinking about this. In order to break apart an old molecule, or I should say, in order to react molecules which is, which is with each other, we first have to break apart the old arrangement of the molecules, and that requires energy. So bonds that are higher in bond energy are going to be harder to break, and that's going to slow down the reaction process. So bond strength can play an important role in how fast certain reactions happen. Now, concentration is also something that has a huge effect on reaction rates, and this is one we're going to concentrate on a lot in this chapter. As the concentration of reaction reactants increase, so does the likelihood that the reactant molecules will collide with each other. So the more substances you have mixed together, the much more likely that you're going to have a successful collision. Another thing that has a large effect on this situation would be temperature. At higher temperatures, your reactant molecules have more kinetic energy. That means they are moving faster, so they're going to collide more often. And when they do collide, they're going to collide with greater energy. And one thing you should remember about pre-AP chemistry is the concept of activation energy. How much energy do we need to break apart the old things and make the new things? Well, to reach that minimum energy, it's much more likely when you have higher kinetic energy at higher temperatures. Now, just a general rule of thumb with this. Every 10 degrees increase approximately doubles your reaction rate. And this is a rule of thumb. It doesn't mean that it always works. But fundamentally, if you had a reaction that was occurring at 20 degrees and you carried out that same reaction at 30 degrees, that increase in temperature would on average, somewhere around double the reaction rate. So every time you go up 10 degrees Celsius, you're doubling the reaction rate in many reaction situations. Now, presence of a catalyst. Another thing, and this is something from pre-AP chemistry and biology you should be familiar with, is the presence of a catalyst. Catalysts speed up reactions. And one of the things we haven't gotten into heavily, although yes, in pre-AP chemistry, you started to touch on the idea of reaction mechanisms. Um, but we're going to get much more heavily into what is it that catalysts are really doing inside the reaction. Because all, all in all, it doesn't look like they're doing much. They're there at the beginning. They're there at the end. So it doesn't, doesn't look like they react. But if you take them out of the situation, the reaction happens at a much slower rate. So they're speeding up the reaction by actually changing the mechanism. The process by which the actual step-by-step -step collision that leads to reaction is going to be different when that catalyst is present. Just on the surface, it looks like it's not doing anything. So that's a part of the overall reaction. You're not going to see it on the reactant or product side. We typically write them over the arrow in a chemical reaction. And this says, and they're not consumed during the course of the reaction. Well, it's not that they're not consumed. It's that they're consumed and then remade again. So overall, they're there at the beginning and they're there at the end. It looks like they did nothing, but from a reaction mechanism point of view, they were very much involved. Another thing that can have an effect is surface area. And this goes back to typically when we're looking at solid substances. Except for substances in the gaseous state or as solutions, um, things really occur on the boundary between. So if you have an interaction between a liquid and a gas, well, where they're interacting is the boundary between the two. So surface area is going to have an effect in those cases. This is a huge factor when you're dealing with solids and reactions because 
the only place that solid can react is on its outer surface. And so if you break it up into smaller pieces, you open up a lot of reaction sites and can affect the overall surface area. So the greater the surface area, the greater the chance for collisions and the faster the rate is going to be. Now, one thing that's related to these concepts um, that I want to throw in at this point, and this isn't something that the book mentions or stresses, but it's something that often pops up on the AP test related to these ideas. Now, remember, when you add an inert gas into a situation, it's an inert gas. That means it's not reacting. So it's not going to have an effect on the overall reaction rate. So if you've got a gas reaction and you're adding an inert gas, it's not really going to affect the overall reaction rate. And it's a common thing to put in there to get you to think, well, maybe it's affecting the pressure, maybe it's doing whatever. Remember, when you're adding an inert gas, it's not going to have an effect on the reaction rate that's occurring in that situation. Section 14.2, and this is really where more of, we're going to get into some more math ideas related to this. So we're going from concepts into the realm of math, is dealing with reaction rates from a mathematical point of view. Now, reaction or rates of reactions can be determined by monitoring the change in concentration of either the reactants or the products. Obviously, as you're consuming reactants, their concentrations are dropping. As you're making products, their concentrations are increasing. Well, you can gauge how fast the reaction is occurring by looking at how fast your concentrations on either sides are changing. And rates always deal with something changing in a given amount of time. So it's how much your concentration is changing as a function of time. So if we have a simple reaction system here between A and B. So A is producing B. Over time, A is going to be decreasing and B is going to be increasing. Now, by convention, rates are always expressed as positive quantities. So when we talk about the rate of reaction on the reactant side, now I would agree the reactant concentration is dropping. So when you do change in concentration, which would be always final minus initial, you're going to get a negative number. Well, to level the playing field and make it a simpler concept, notice that we've multiplied our reactant situation here by negative 1. So that's going to take into account the fact that final minus initial is going to return a negative value. Multiply by negative 1, and you're going to get a positive quantity. So the negative of the change in concentration of the reactants over the change in time would equal the change in products over time. Now, the brackets that you see here denote molar concentrations. You're going to be dealing with molarity a lot in this chapter. Anytime you see brackets, we're dealing with molar concentration. So most of the time when we're talking about reaction rates, you're going to see it expressed as molarity per time. Could be per minute, could be per second. Those are the time frames you typically see, although it can be other times as well. But one thing to keep in mind is, in some situations, we have gases involved in the reaction. And the number of moles of gas particles, which is related to concentration, is directly proportional to the pressure that those gas particles would exert. So as we're changing the number of particles, we'd be changing the concentration. We'd also be changing the pressure in a proportional amount. So sometimes you'll see rates of reactions involving gases written as you know, pressure changes per given amount of time, like you know, how many torr, how many millimeters of mercury, how many atmospheres per second is the pressure changing. Now here we're going to take a look at and break down a typical reaction. So here's a reaction between C4H9Cl and water to make C4H9OH. So hopefully this is something that looks familiar. These are hydrocarbon type substances. The first one we have here is four carbons stuck together. Four carbons, that's meth, eth, prop, but. So we're dealing with basically butane. But it's got a chlorine substitute on one of the carbons. So this would be um, one chlorine onto a butane. So it's chloral butane. And it's reacting with water to make an alcohol and hydrochloric acid. So here's an example of a typical reaction. Now you'll notice that for the reaction over here, we have a table that looks at what's happening with at different amounts of time to the concentration of our chloral butane. So at a time, we have a specific concentration. Now, it should be no big surprise here that as time is going by, we're using up our reactant, so the concentration is dropping. Now, if we take a look at each time interval here, 0 to 50, 50 to 100, 100 to 150, we can look at a change in concentration per change in time, and we can calculate a reaction rate. Now, since this is the 
average rate over this time interval, you'll notice it says average rates in molarity per second for each of these. The average rate of reaction over each time interval is the change in concentration divided by the change in time. So we're using this equation we briefly mentioned on the previous slide. And since we're looking at a reaction here, technically if you did this with concentrations, you get a negative value, so it's technically the negative of that. And that's why we get positive values for each of these. So over each of the time intervals here, we can look at what the average reaction rate is over those different time intervals. Now notice that the average rate decreases as the reaction proceeds. Well, why does that happen? Well, think it through. Remember, reactions are caused by collisions. And as we're using up reactants, we're going to get fewer collision between our reactant molecules. And it would make sense over time that our reaction rate is going to be slowing down. So over time in any given reaction, your rate is going to start out fast because you've got the maximum number of particles colliding when you've got a lot of particles. And then over time, that rate is going to slowly or is going to slow down over time. And that's exactly what you would expect. Now, if you plot the concentration versus the time, you would get a graph that looks something like this. So we basically just took that data and plugged it into a graph. Now, the slope of um, any tangent point to this line is really what our, how our rate would be changing at that instant in time. So now we're not looking at an average rate, we're looking at an instantaneous rate. And for those of you who are going on to calculus next year, um, this is actually where some calculus would come into play. There's a couple different situations in this chapter that deal with calculus. If you know the equation for this line, so if we can generate the equation for this line, the first derivative at this point right here would actually give us the slope. So that's something you'll be doing next year in calculus. And when we're dealing with reactions, we often will deal with what are called instantaneous rates. Now, if you don't know calculus, you don't have the equation for a, a line, um, these are difficult to calculate. So while it's easy to calculate an average rate, change in concentration over change in time, it's a little bit bigger of a pain to experimentally determine what instantaneous rates are. So these are usually provided in the problem for us. But that's what it would be if we had the line, the slope of that line at any given point, in this case at any given time, um, would be our instantaneous rate. So it's the change in y over the change in x at that point. So you would draw the tangent line at that spot and then do a change in y over change in x to calculate what the slope is. And that's how you'd calculate the instantaneous rate at any point in that reaction. Now you can see here the same idea we talked about when we were talking about average rates. As the reaction progresses, so over time the reaction is going to slow down. So therefore, the best indicator of the overall reaction would be an instantaneous rate at near the beginning, because that's when our reaction is happening at its fastest. So we will often deal with what are known as initial rates. All initial rate means is the instantaneous rate at time zero. And you'll often see that you know, in the table, say, um, initial rate. That just means the instantaneous rate at time zero for these conditions. Now in this reaction, because we've got a balanced chemical equation here, there is a relationship between the different substances and their rates. So in this reaction, we've got a ratio between our butanol and our chlorobutane one to one. So what that would mean is the rate of disappearance of our reactant is going to be the same exact rate as the appearance of our product here. So two rates are tied to each other through the process of stoichiometry. So these rates would be equal, but of course, since we're talking about reactant and product, they'd be opposite in sign. That's why we multiply the chlorobutane by negative one. But what happens if the stoichiometry is not one-to-one? -one? So if you take a look at this reaction, we have two HIs making H2 plus I2. It's not a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one stoichiometry throughout. So what's gonna happen here with relative rates? Well, obviously, we're using the HI twice as fast as we're making either H2 or I2. So this, let me pop back a second here. The rate that this is occurring is going to be double the rate at which that is occurring. So to establish an equality between the two, you'd have to say that it's half of this would equal that. And notice it has that negative there. That's because we're talking about a reactant versus a product here. So negative 
half of the rate of the change in HI concentration over time would equal our change in I2. So to generalize for any equation here, if we're taking a look at some reaction of A reacting with B to make C and D, in our lowercase letters are our coefficients in our balanced equation, we can establish that how would A relate to B? Well, negative 1 over A times its change in concentration over time uh, over change in time would equal negative 1 over B times the concentration change over the change in time. And on our product side, notice we lose the negatives, but we still have to take into account the coefficients here. So if these coefficients were 1 in each of these spots, it would basically be a very simple relationship. The negative of the first two would equal the second two. But if it's not a one-to-one-to-one, -one -to -one, we can plug in any numbers. So what this basically means is if we know the concentration, I should say we know the rate of a reaction with respect to one of the substances, and that's an important idea. You need to understand when we talk about reaction rates, it's with respect to a certain substance typically. But through stoichiometry, we can look at the rates of other substances or with respect to other substances in the reaction as well. Now, most of the time when you see problems, it will say with respect to A or with respect to B or with respect to C. But sometimes it just says, well, the reaction rate is this. Well, when we're speaking of it in general terms, we're looking at the exact relationship you see here. So the rate overall of this reaction. So even if this were a 2, 2, 2, 3 reaction, and none of these were 1, if I'm talking about the rate with respect to A, that would equal the rate with respect to C, B because they have the same stoichiometry. They're both 2 to 2, which is the same as 1 to 1. But if I'm talking about the general rate of this overall reaction, and I'm not specifying with, re with respect to what, I would take whatever the rate is for A, and divide it by what this actual coefficient was. So if this was a 3, I would report that rate as one-third, negative one-third of the change in concentration of A over T. So if it doesn't say with respect to a certain substance, then what you're doing is taking into account the coefficients and the stoichiometry of the reaction. So normally it will specify with respect to what substance, but if it doesn't, remember this is exactly what it would mean. And if the coefficients were all ones, then it would be the rate of A would be the same as the ge general rate of the reaction. But if this was a 2 right here, that would mean, and let's say this was a 1 right here, that would mean the general rate of that reaction would be the same as the rate with respect to B. But A is happening twice as fast, so the rate of A occurring would actually be double the rate of B. So it would be um, the rate of A, one half of the rate of A would equal the rate of B. So remember, typically they specify with respect to what, but if it doesn't, it means that general term, an idea that we looked at in the last slide. Now, here is a couple of typical problems. So this is, let's finish up our notes with practicing some of the, these ideas. If H2 is burning at a rate of 0.85 moles per second, what is the rate of consumption of oxygen? So they're giving us the rate with respect to H2, and they're asking us what is the rate with respect to O2. That means you have to take into account the stoichiometry. Remember, for this reaction, the generic rate with respect to the reaction as a whole would equal negative one half of H2 over time, and that's going to equal negative of O2 over time, which would equal one half of H2O over time. So that's our general relationships between the substances here. Well, I mean, if you think it through, that means hydrogen is reacting twice as fast, double the rate of oxygen. So half of hydrogen would equal the rate of oxygen. So in this particular case, that would be 0.43 molarity per second. So all we're really doing here is taking into account the stoichiometry. So when you're going from the rate with respect to one substance versus another, you're taking into account the stoichiometry between the two. Now, what would be the rate of formation of water vapor? So now we're looking at the rate with respect to water. Well, notice it's a 2 to 2 stoichiometry between hydrogen and water. So it's going to end up being the exact same number. So 0.85 moles per second would be the rate with respect to water. Another problem. In this case, we're looking at a gas reaction. So notice here it says if the partial pressure of NO decreases by 23 torrs per minute. Remember I said sometimes we can talk about reaction rates for gases with respect to a change in pressure versus time. Same idea, same math. It's just we have a different unit here. Now we're not talking about molarity. 
So if that is our partial pressure decrease per time, in other words, that's our rate, that would be the rate with respect to NO. So what is the rate of change for the total pressure of the vessel? So we've got multiple gases here all being involved in a change. Now remember, there's a relationship through the stoichiometry with how the different gases in the vessel are going to be um, affecting um, one another. Because of the stoichiometry, we're using up NO twice as fast as we're using up Cl2. Now both of those would drops in pressure, negative values. And then on the flip side, you're going to be gaining pressure because you're making NOCL. Notice the stoichiometry there is 2 to 2 between NO and NOCL. So that would mean that in terms of what's happening, from with respect to the NO, you're going to be losing 23 torres per minute. With respect to CL2, which is a 2 to 1 stoichiometry, it's going to be decreasing half as much. So that's going to be 23 over 2, about 12 torres per minute. That's how much they're going down. But at the same time, you're creating NOCL. That's going up at the same rate that NO is going down. So those two are going to negate each other. And overall, what's going to happen is we're going to have a net decrease of negative 12 torres per minute. So here we're not only looking at the relationship between each individual thing, but we're looking at the relationship overall with the pressure. So the pressure is going to decrease by 12 torres per minute if that's our reaction rate. And that ends our first set of notes for Chapter 14, as well as our first set of notes for first semester. Or I should say second semester.